It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the BenQ EX2710. The OSD is controlled by buttons and a joystick at the rear of the screen. There's also a dedicated HDRI button at the front, which cycles through the different HDR modes or the HDR emulation modes if you're running an SDR, and I'll go through them very shortly. There's also a power LED which glows white when the monitor's on, or glows amber when it enters a low power state, so signal to the system is lost. I've now got the camera quite close to the screen, so you will see some dancing lines on the screen. Moiré from the camera, that's what that is, it isn't actually observed on the screen itself, but you can't avoid those strange little patterns when you're this close to the screen. If you press the first button, it allows you to select the input used by the monitor. If you twiddle the joystick, which is the next button, left, right, or press it in, you get this quick menu up, and you can configure this in the main menu system itself, which I'll show you shortly. If you twiddle the joystick up or down, then you can quickly adjust the volume of the integrated speakers, or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack if you're using that. So this little quick menu here, if you go into the menu, the main menu, you can see here it says quick menu. It's got standard game and cinema. The game and cinema modes will be greyed out unless you are using a scenario, as they call them, on this monitor. What they'll do is they'll set your preset and also your sound mode to various different settings, and they'll also have a different quick menu assigned. So if you go on input here, you can see it says scenario. I've got that setting off at the moment, but if I enable that, you'll see by default it actually sets the colour mode to RPG. I'll go through that shortly. I don't actually like that colour mode but you can change it anyway, it doesn't matter. It's just the default it sets it to. Then there's audio mode game. And again, you can just change that to whatever you want, even if you are using the scenario. But if you go into the quick menu, you'll now see the standard game and cinema. And you can also see that if you go on to DP game, so it's just Bayport game, you can change that to standard game or cinema, depending on the scenario you want to use. And again, you can override anything manually. It just changes the default settings. So by default, you can see the quick menu for standard has, it's always input and color mode at the, at the start of that, but there's AMA, advanced motion acceleration, brightness, low blue light. In game, there is light tuner, AMA and brightness. And I'll go through these particular features when I get to them in the main menu system. And there's cinema, which has brightness, audio mode and volume. But if you like, in fact, I'll just turn off the scenario just to show you that it doesn't actually matter if that's on or not here. So you can change that to various different things, light tuner, black equalizer, color vibrance, AMA, contrast, audio mode, volume, or blur reduction. There's also a few that are grayed out, and that's just because I'm using them already. Just note that black equalizer and light tuner, uh, I will go through these shortly, but they only apply to certain presets. Some presets will have one, some presets will have the other. So you have to be a bit careful with that. So for example, if I change this to black equalizer and I'm using the standard preset, I'll go into the quick menu you see that's just greyed out. I can't use it with this particular preset, that's why. So coming back to the input menu, these scenarios, you have a different scenario for HDMI 1, HDMI 2 and DisplayPort. So you set them all independently, but even if you're not using scenarios, the monitor actually has separate sets of settings for different inputs. So if I change the brightness and the colour channels, for example, with DisplayPort, I then connect something to HDMI, they'll have a different set of settings there as well. So I can tweak things differently for different systems. That's really the idea there. I'm now in game on Battlefield 5 and I'm gonna go through the HDRI menu, the HDR settings of the monitor. So if you press that little button on the front, HDRI, you can just cycle these different settings. So HDR here is really the main one. The monitor is receiving an SDR signal. So all this is is an HDR emulation mode. It even says there HDR emulated. And I don't really like the term HDR emulation mode. You either have an HDR signal or, as in this case, you don't. But really what this does is it applies an extra sharpness filter. It also oversaturates things and it does that mainly by adjusting the gamma curve of the monitor. So it makes things look more cinematic. It makes some of these shades look a lot deeper and more saturated. They actually look quite unnatural, to be honest. But some people will like this look, and if you do, then by all means use it. There's nothing wrong with using it if, if you like how it looks there. There are also game HDRI and cinema HDRI settings. So the HDRI settings, it does what the HDR setting did there, but it also uses a light sensor. 
that's integrated into the bottom bezel, just beneath the BenQ logo at the front. And this makes adjustments to the image based on the room lighting, the ambient lighting. What I find is, well, a couple of things. I don't like that because it blocks off your brightness control, sets everything automatically. Everyone has their own different sensitivities and preferences when it comes to brightness, so having the monitor just decide what to do there for you is a bit strange, to be honest. The adjustments it makes may happen to work for some people, fair enough. I also find it tends to set the colour temperature so it's too cool. Things are, are too cool tinted, too blue looking, it's kind of icy look to things. So you'll see now you can't adjust the brightness and things like the low blue light. You can't adjust the colour channels either with these little HDR settings. Cinema HDRI is quite similar to game HDRI, except it increases the sharpness filter further. I should mention as well, the HDRI settings have a stronger sharpness filter than the main HDR setting. And in fact, I don't think the main HDR setting really has much of, if any, of a sharpness filter. But the HDRI settings certainly do. And I think it ramps up the gamma further, so things look even more cinematic with the Cinema HDRI setting, which might seem quite appropriate, I suppose. But again, it's using that light sensor, making adjustments to the image based on that as well. You can see for that HDR setting, colour mode HDR, you can actually adjust the brightness. If the monitor's getting an HDR signal, I actually explore what these settings do in the review, so I'm not going to repeat that here. They're actually explored in both the video and written review. But it now has an HDR signal, so the HDR setting is actually appropriate to use. It's not just emulated, it's actual HDR, or at least something resembling HDR. And you can see, again, you can adjust the brightness with the main HDR settings, but the HDRI settings, they use the light sensor to adjust that. But if I go into the main menu, you'll see that I lose access to a lot of different settings. So a lot of this is greyed out. Yes, you can adjust brightness and contrast here, although my recommendation is actually just to leave those both to default, otherwise it really just upsets the image balance. AMA, Advanced Motion Acceleration, you can change that as well. You can't enable blur reduction because that isn't compatible with HDR. That changes the backlight behavior so it strobes and it starts flickering basically. But I'll go through that when I get to it in the main menu. So back to this main menu, you've got color mode, and that's where you set the preset of the monitor. I've shown you the HDR type settings. There's also FPS, which strongly oversaturates things. And it does this in an unnatural way, a very unnatural way. It's not just a gamma enhancement. It actually pulls things closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So you lose shade variety when you do this. The most saturated shades remain the same, but shades that should be less saturated appear a lot more saturated than they should. So things look very unnatural. It also makes things look too cool, and that's not cool as in a good way, it's cool as in blue tinted. RPG is different, it makes different adjustments, but again, things look really funky for other reasons. It looks like the gamma's far too high, for example. And note that when I talk about things like gamma, you can't adjust the gamma setting when you're using these because it sets it to something that's quite different to the main settings there. There are things you can adjust here that are specific to certain presets. FPS, you've got black equalizer. This, oh, and by the way, it also seems that it adds a bit of a sharpness filter to the FPS setting as well. It looks a bit over sharpened, I'd say. Although it makes so many changes that it's kind of difficult to separate out different changes it's making there. But the black equalizer setting, this is designed to enhance your visibility in dark areas. So give you a competitive edge if you're gaming, that kind of thing. So it's set to three by default, it seems. If you increase this, it increases the visibility of darker shades in particular. It actually affects some lighter shades as well. It's not just the darker shades. But unlike some settings of this nature, it's a more gradual adjustment and it doesn't have a dramatic effect on your black point. So with some settings of this type, if you increase this even slightly, it will completely destroy your contrast. It'll make everything look completely flooded. This is more granular than that, so to speak. So. It has a bit more of a targeted effect. So it's good, competitively speaking. If you reduce it below three, that's where you start to give things a more cinematic look. Shades look a lot deeper than they should overall, especially those dark shades, and they start blending together. You'll see the RPG setting instead has light tuner. That's actually a feature that's available in the standard preset, which I much prefer. So I'll go through that when I get to the standard preset instead. There's racing game as well. This looks oversaturated and has various other things that just changes that you can't adjust yourself, such as gamma and color temperature. So you can't adjust the color channels or the gamma setting. You can see it has light tuner set to minus one by default. And again, 
I'll go through that in the standard mode. So here it is, the standard setting. So the first setting to go through is light tuner. That's set to zero by default with the standard setting. If you give it a plus one, plus two, plus three, again, the main thing it does is give you a competitive advantage by raising those dark shades so they're brighter. So enemies would stand out better in dark areas, dark shadowy areas, that kind of thing. If you decrease this, it's a bit weird actually. Minus one, it seems to look very much the same as plus one to me. It's, yeah, it looks exactly the same. But if you reduce that further, it starts to make these dark shades darker. They blend together, just like it did with the black equalizer, if you use a low setting there. The changes it makes are a bit different with light tuner and black equalizer. So if I just close Legom and look at this car here, you won't be able to see exactly what this does. You can't see exactly what things look like when you're looking at someone else's video on your own screen, but you'll see that deactivated versus activated, it definitely lifts out the shadow details, but it also starts affecting some of the brighter shades as well. The red, the representation of red is quite different. But you can see it's fairly targeted, fairly well targeted. If I go back to FPS and go on black equalizer, FPS makes all sorts of weird adjustments by default, so it's kind of difficult to compare these, to be honest. So I'm not sure if there's some technical difference between what they do, but really they're both to give you a competitive advantage. Next up, you've got Color Vibrance. This is a digital saturation boost. So if you recall, I said with some of these presets, Racing Game is a good example, FPS as well. I said that things look very much oversaturated, and they do. If you decrease the Color Vibrance feature, though, it actually ends up that some shades look quite dull and undersaturated, whereas some maintain oversaturation, so you can't really get the balance right by doing that. That's because they actually use a separate filter for the extra saturation here with some of these presets. But back to the standard setting, the color vibrance works as you might expect, tends to default, and that's things looking correct. If you increase this, it's a digital saturation adjustment, so it pull shades closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So there was a nice variety of various red shades on that car before, and now with this setting cranked up, it just crushes everything together. Things look very cartoonish. You lose that shade variety. And again, the exact differences are very difficult to show you in a video, but you get the idea. If you decrease this, it starts desaturating things. Eventually it becomes completely grayscale. You can, of course, adjust color vibrance to your own personal preferences, that's fine, but I much prefer it just set to the default of 10, which gives you the full shade range and keeps things looking much more as they should. Brightness, contrast, gamma, you can set this between one and five, and the exact values that these will give you in terms of gamma will change depending on your unit, but on my unit, Three was the best, three was the default. I should say closest to the gamma curve, which I like my monitors to follow, and that would be the 2.2 curve. And this is all explored in the calibration section of the written review. Color temperature, you can set this to user define if you want to manually adjust the red, green, and blue color channels. Set it to normal, which is a factor of default. Bluish, which makes things cool tinted, gives you a high white point. Reddish, which is sort of like a mild low blue light setting, very mild low blue light setting, it makes things warmer in appearance. AMA, Advanced Motion Acceleration, again explored in the review, you can set this between 0 and 3. So this is the gray to gray acceleration, or the pixel overdrive setting of the monitor, the response time setting, if you prefer. Blur reduction, all you're going to see on the video is some flickering on the screen. So I'm not going to give you a flicker warning just before I activate this, which I'm about to do right now. So the screen is now flickering at 144 hertz, so it matches the refresh rate of the screen. You can set it to do this at 120 hertz or 100 hertz as well. The idea of this is that it reduces the perceived blur due to eye movement, so it does live up to its name of blur reduction. You can't use it at the same time as adaptive sync, but how it works and what it does for you, it's all explored in the review. I just wanted to show you the setting in the menu and that you can activate it or deactivate it. And you'll see it says FreeSync Premium Off, and that's just because it disables Adaptive Sync when it's enabled. You can't use them both at the same time. So I've now got Blur Reduction Off again, and it says FreeSync Premium On. Be aware that this means that Adaptive Sync is enabled. 
on my NVIDIA GPU, if I have G-Sync compatible mode disabled in the driver, I'll just quickly do that now. You'll see the screen goes blank, re-establishes connection. It now says FreeSync Premium off. On my AMD GPU, for some reason, it didn't matter if I had the setting enabled in the driver or not. It always said FreeSync Premium on. I also noticed with my NVIDIA GPU that the refresh rate there changed depending on the frame rate of the content when I was using Adaptive Sync or G-Sync compatible mode. Whereas on my AMD GPU, it always just gave the static refresh rate that it was set to. The technology worked all the same though. It did its thing as I explore in the review. It just seems to report it a bit differently, or at least it did on my NVIDIA versus my AMD GPU. And there's an option here, reset color, which will reset the standard setting, I believe, to the factory defaults. I'm not sure if it resets everything to the factory defaults because I don't really want to try it and wipe all of my settings. So sorry about that. Next, you've got sRGB, which is an sRGB emulation setting. A bit of a strange thing to have on this monitor, actually, in, in some respects, because the color gamut actually tracks sRGB quite closely. But as I show in the review, it does have a little bit of overextension, which is curtailed with the sRGB setting, the sRGB emulation setting. But you can see that you have more restrictions with what you can set here. So you can at least adjust the brightness, but you can't change things like the gamma or the color temperature settings. Next, you've got MBook MacBook, which is supposed to give you output that's better matches a MacBook display, but naturally that would depend how you set everything up. But it restricts a lot of this as well. You've got brightness that you can control, AMA, advanced motion acceleration, but that's really it. Next is ePaper. Again, lots of stuff grayed out here. You can adjust the brightness and contrast and AMA setting, but actually this just makes everything grayscale and it gives a bit of a warm look to the image as well. So really it's just supposed to simulate e-paper or e-paper devices. Next you've got the eye care menu, so BI plus. I mentioned this in relation to the HDR eye settings before, but you can also activate it outside of those HDR settings or those HDR emulation settings. So the screen is now making adjustments based on the image. It's also making adjustments based on input from the light sensor. And again, I don't agree with these adjustments. Everyone has their own light sensitivity, so Without being able to adjust the brightness in any way, you'll see brightness is completely grayed out now. And actually so is color temperature and gamma, so it's changing lots of things based on the image and based on the room lighting as well. It, you know, it's just doing basically far too much making these adjustments, which I don't agree with. For example, if I'm sitting in a room that's fairly dim, in my opinion, sometimes I find the setting is too bright, Depending on the lighting, it might be too dim for my taste as well. There's nothing where I can say, okay, I'd want it to be brighter in these conditions or dimmer in these conditions. You know, I've got my own sensitivity and my own preferences. And also I find that often it has an overly cool tint to the image. The color temperature is too cool. So if I've got my room lighting set to, let's say, 4000K, I don't know why I'd want my monitor to be pumping out 7,500K. Might have been a bit of an extreme example there, but you get the idea. It just doesn't match up what it should and what I'd expect it to do. So more flexibility with this setting would be nice. Being able to decouple the light sensor functionality from everything else would also be nice. There's also a light meter. So this just gives you a little notification, a little icon on the screen to say when the BI Plus is changing based on the brightness. You'll see that icon there now. Just giving you an indication that the brightness is changing. You can change the sensor sensitivity. So if you're finding it's too sensitive or not sensitive enough, your room lighting is clearly changing and it's not doing what you want, then you can change the sensor sensitivity. You can set that to 100 or zero between the two in increments of 10. I find the setting of 50 is fine, but again, I don't really like the adjustments the setting makes either way. Next, you've got low blue light. So the low blue light settings of the monitor, you can set that between zero and 20 in increments of one. So a high number there is a stronger setting. So particularly with these very high values, you have a very effective low blue light setting. It greatly cuts down the strength of the blue channel, reduces the blue light output from the monitor very effectively, and it gives a warmer look to the image. Unlike some low blue light settings, it doesn't give an annoying green tint or greenish yellow tint. So it's better balanced in that respect, and it's easier for your eyes to adjust to. Your eyes do adjust to this to a fair extent. 
over time, becomes more natural looking. And it's good to use this kind of setting, particularly in the hours leading up towards bed, towards sleep, when your body should be shutting off. You don't want to expose yourself to stimulating blue light, disrupts your sleep hormones, that kind of thing. So I do like to use this myself in the evening, set to a very strong value. But as I showed, good flexibility there if you like a bit of a weaker setting. And some people might like to use this in the day as well, and that's fine if that's what you prefer. Next up, there's color weakness. So this is designed if you have color blindness or color weakness, it, what it's called depends on where you live. There's a red filter, which adjusts the display of red shades. And there's a green filter setting, which does the same for greens. And you can adjust both of these. So I could say, set that to 15 and this to three, if that is what works for you. As someone with normal colour vision, it's hard for me to, you know, say if this, this works or this helps, but it, but it should, in theory, help. The next settings, one that's very interesting, I've come across it on a few BenQ monitors before, but I haven't really tried it before. On this one I did give it a bit of a spin. Adjust by duration, it's quite interesting. So what this will do is it progressively makes the image warmer the longer you've had the screen on. So I set this to on at about 10 a.m. one day, for example, and it was set to 6,500K, that's my target white point. And by 6 p.m. the same day, it was closer to 5,000K. So basically at that point, it's activated a moderate low blue light setting. So it does what it's supposed to do. The only thing I'd say is that if you turn your monitor off at any point, it does reset the, the timer, the adjust by duration timer. So it's something which you'd have to use if you are keeping the monitor on all day or just for long periods of time, then it has a bit of an effect. What I would say though is I'm not sure if it would make further adjustment beyond about 5000k. I prefer a stronger low blue light setting myself further into the evening, so I just set that manually so I didn't really wait and see if this setting helped in that respect. But it certainly did something and it's quite a useful setting which I think some users will quite like to use. Next up, you've got audio. This allows you to change the volume or the audio mode or mute the integrated speakers and anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack. I don't think the audio mode settings really apply to that. They, they may make some changes actually, but they're, they're more for the speakers, the integrated speakers. And as I mentioned in the review, the integrated speakers are quite decent. So there's Pop Live, Cinema or Game. They just change the balance, the equalizer settings. Again, it's all explored in the written review. So definitely check that out if you're interested in the speakers of this monitor. Finally, there's system, OSD settings. You can change the language that the OSD is displayed in, the display time, which is how long it will display after the last button press before it automatically disappears. They're quite ninja-like with the settings, actually. 20 seconds when you're trying to record a video as I am, sometimes a little bit too fast. It sort of disappears because I don't interact with the menu all the time when I'm talking. So it sometimes just disappears on me when I don't want it to. But anyway, for most users, most normal users, using the monitor normally, absolutely fine. 3 to 20 seconds with these increments shown there. OSD lock. If you activate that, it says OSD locked. Now, I often get people in my videos asking how I unlock the OSD because they've accidentally locked it or someone else has locked it. And if you press a button on this monitor, it actually tells you what you have to do. Press and hold any key for 10 seconds to unlock OSD. So that's pretty straightforward, although that does take a little bit of time. 10 seconds is quite a long period of time. And when you're actually waiting to have the OSD unlocked, it feels a lot longer than 10 seconds, but there we are. Next is auto power off. And this is another feature which I quite like that not many monitors seem to have. This means that if the screen loses signal to the PC, so basically you've shut your PC down or your system down and the monitor is no longer getting a video signal, it will just automatically turn itself off after a given amount of time as if you press the power button. And this monitor, I didn't actually mention that earlier, but the third button there, you might recall there were actually three buttons. There was one at the top, there was the joystick, and there was one at the bottom, as well as that HDRI button on the front. But the bottom button at the back, that's actually the power button. So it does have a dedicated power button. You don't have to fiddle around with the joystick to try and turn the power off to the monitor, which can be quite annoying. But of course, if you've got this set, you can just leave the monitor to do its thing for 10 minutes, and then it'll turn itself off, which is quite nice. Or 20 minutes or 30 minutes. There's display, display mode. So these are scaling settings, which apply if you're using a non-native resolution, full aspect and one-to-one. -one. So one-to-one, -one, the pixel mapping functionality, this will give you a black border and it'll only use the pixels called for in the source resolution. 
whereas the full setting will use all of the pixels. The aspect setting will use as many pixels as it can without messing up the aspect ratio and distorting or stretching the image in that way. There's also overscan, and that is grayed out unless you are using HDMI, I believe. I have definitely seen this setting in action while I was using HDMI. It could have been that you have to have FreeSync disabled. I'm not sure of the exact conditions, to be honest. I think it's an HDMI thing, though. And this will basically stretch the image and kind of slightly enlarge the image so it runs off the screen. I know some people like this in some games for competitive reasons. because I've had people mention that to me. But it's really more designed for older systems where the image doesn't look right unless you do that. It's a flexibility you have either way. There's an RGB PC range setting, so that sets either a limited range or full range RGB color signal. Auto detect looks at what the system wants to use and should set this appropriately, but if you want to manually change it, RGB 0 to 255, that's your full range signal, that's what most people should be using, but if you need to enforce a limited range signal for whatever reason, that's what the RGB 16 to 235 setting does. Next you've got information, displays a few things about the screen, such as the current resolution and refresh rate it's running at, what it calls the optimum resolution, so that's really the native resolution and refresh rate, which it will be quite happy to run at. That doesn't mean that if you set it to a lower refresh rate, it's going to be somehow unhappy, but that's really just the maximum refresh rate um, there, which is the optimum part, and the native resolution, which is optimal. HDR on or off, depending on if you've got an HDR signal detected, and the model name EX2710, just in case you forget that. There's also a reset all, which will reset everything to the factory defaults. So that's really all there is to the OSD, on-screen display menu system of the BenQ EX2710. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.